My friends have a thing, they call it huckling it. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Theo. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And as you can tell, we have a guest who's not physically between the two of us. Yes. It's a weird cosmic thing. Yeah. We're expanding our uh, expanding our technologies here, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. But on the on the line, although are we, I I should should have asked before this, but are we doing picture in picture on this one? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Depends on how it turns out. Let's let's uh, let's assume then Theo's gonna go here or here. No, Theo's gonna like go above over, my face. Over yeah, my nipples? No. <laughs> I just want to know where I want to where I want to point. But anyways, somewhere between here and here and here and here. We have Theo on the line all the way from the Shire. Yeah. Also, I literally can't see where you're pointing, so I have no idea where yeah, I'm going. Yeah, also, there neither can any one of our listeners. Anyone I understand who... that trolling our listeners is uh, our favorite hobby, but yes, Theo is joining us from Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> Super special. 3,000 miles away. <laughs> it is quite far. Uh, thank, oh, thank you very you much for joining us. Mm. And oh, today's topic is social justice warriors. Bum, bum, bum! That was such a bit dramatic. Well done. Yes. So, uh, but first, you know, we should define them, and then we'll get into our icebreaker. Okay. Uh, so what is, a, what is a social justice warrior? Theo, are you a social justice warrior? I have been told I'm a social justice warrior. I've also been mm. told I'm a social justice ranger, so I'm not quite sure what my class is at the moment. <laughs> you can multi-class yeah totally uh, yeah no I've definitely been called a social justice warrior I don't know if it was ever meant as a compliment but hey it doesn't seem that way no it doesn't um, seem it seems people will sort of throw it as a label at people as like you have an opinion I don't agree with and my shouting at you is not making you suddenly agree with me so I'm going to call you this thing mm-hmm. yeah it's it's sort of a pejorative term destro- deployed by reactionaries mm. And, you know, for people who want to exclude reactionaries from spaces or who are deeply concerned with issues of social justice, which means issues of things like privilege, um, queer and trans rights, um, you know, issues facing people of color. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of things that that seems to unpack into. uh, And people have started sort of taking ownership of it and, and reclaiming it. I'm finding um, <clears throat> in some of the YouTube videos I watch, uh, it is being conflated, not quite often used synonymously, but under the umbrella of this idea of a regressive left, and then the social justice warrior is somehow a subset of that category of people. Neat. I'm finding that a lot of... Because um, I, I do watch videos, and this is probably going to make people hate me, if I watch videos from like Sarkhan of Akkad, um, less so the Amazing Atheist, um, Thunderfoot. I do watch them, and they do make heavy reference to the idea of a regressive left. Um, they don't necessarily say one is identical with the other, but they tend to throw around terms like the regressive left and the social justice camp. So it seems mm-hmm. like you have a global term of the regressive left, and then you have a micro term of the social justice, but I don't know what else is caught in that umbrella, which is why I, I only have the sense that like one is a subset of the other, but I don't know what else is included in the overall umbrella term. Well, and and, and th- those guys actually sort of uh, pushed part, part of my shift in the movement. I used to watch their videos too, and mm-hmm. then they sort of joyfully came out of the closet a few years ago as misogynists, and I was mm-hmm. like, okay, maybe we're done now. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, and then there's sort of there's also there's also this equation of social justice warriors with sort of slacktivists, mm-hmm. uh, which is a weird, I think, false equivalence. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense, Theo? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, social justice warrior seems to be a term that's for people who dare to speak out. I find like mm-hmm. the slacktivist is kind of people who just sort of retweet the things and the petitions and whatever, and it's so sort of, it's an easy way of showing you care, and then. People who act, oh god, the house phone's gone off. Sorry. Uh, people who then actually speak out. That's when they come for you. And you're like, yeah, you throw shit your way, which is great fun. Mm-hmm. 
Sorry, I just yeah, it's, <laughs> no, it's, we swear on our podcast. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not to say. Well, yeah, I guess that's true. That's part of your common vernacular. <laughs> But uh, yeah, slacktivism, you know, it's, it's petitions and stuff. And social justice warriors, it's fighting with people on the internet. Mm -hmm. That is sort of what uh, we, I, I've, I've also had the term apply to me, are known for. Mm -hmm. uh, so now that we've sort of dug out some of that meaning, at least, we can actually do a real icebreaker. What is one social justice resource that you would recommend? Theo, as the guest, you may go first. Oh, good. Um, the one I, I kind of go to, one I've learned a lot from in the last sort of year, especially the last year or so, um, there's a woman who lives, it is a British woman called Zoe Stavery, who writes under the name Stavers quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And like her, her whole thing is one angry woman, another angry woman, sorry, she calls herself. And she tackles like all sorts of topics, like from the politics to like um, so issues around like sort of sexuality, gender, or women's issues, all sorts of stuff. But the way she writes, I find, is really... It's easy to get into and it's easy to understand. She doesn't, But she doesn't talk yeah. down to people at the same time. Which I think... It, sometimes people feel like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I know a lot about this, so I'm going to talk down to people. And it's kind of difficult to read, whereas her stuff isn't as much. So she's like... Her stuff pops up on Twitter, I'm always like, ah, oh, things to read. But nice. yeah, I really enjoy her writing. How can I about you? Um, I... So... I typically don't have a lot in my um, my Feedly feed. Uh, my exposure to it tends to come from links that my friends uh, post on social media. So the one that I tend to find most enlightening um, because it comes at it from you know the the approach that you know a very teaching teaching based approach. Um, at least that, that's the way I, I find that their tone tends to take um, is it's everyday feminism if I'm not yep. uh, mistaken right um, so they have um, a wonderful group of contributors and, and editors and their their tone and um, the way they construct their individual articles are, are very consistent and so I find it's very Eye opening, I guess, is the best way to say it. Um, you know, as a you know, six foot four white guy, my experience of the world is very limited, very very limited, and so it it helps to paint a picture of what uh, life is like for other people, and to give me the um, consequences is the wrong word, but the context of what what living as somebody else uh, and the, their experiences uh, in, a, in a way that is like, wow, I, I really understand what you're saying and, and, uh, and it, helps, it helps. It doesn't put me in the, another person's shoes, per se, but it definitely at least gives me a glimpse into the life of somebody else. So I find uh, that would be the one that I will recommend to put into the show, show notes. Nice. They're really good for sort of inclusive language as well, like the way they, like the actual language they use to talk mm -hmm. about the things. Like, my, I, I think I like about theirs is like every time you see like a post, um, there's usually like an image, and there's always a description of the image underneath. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's mm -hmm. always like there's a person in the foreground with this. It's never like a man or a woman, or it's never assuming things about people. And I quite like that. So that tone of inclusivity makes it, it's, it's really approachable, and it's kind of, it sort of says to people, by the way, remember, don't just assume things just mm -hmm. because we tell you. I quite like mm -hmm. it for that. And inclusivity is a big part of it, too. Like, like the people who get labeled as SJWs are more often than not people who are pushing for inclusivity in spaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that is the the number one thing where, where that comes up. Yeah. For me, I have two answers. Hawk <laughs> usually has two answers, but today I have two. See, I had like six answers, but I took it down to one because I didn't get told off earlier. Well, that's okay. We'll put yeah. all six in the show notes. Well, for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, if, if I had to recommend one, uh, it would be Robot Hugs, which is a comic, and it focuses a lot on issues of gender and sexuality, but it does so in a really interesting and insightful way. I mean, for something that is essentially a stick, it is a stick figure comic, it is great. The second one is Derailing for Dummies. Derailing for Dummies, I read it years ago, and I still go back and read it. 
because as a shitheaded fourth year philosophy student, somebody linked me to it and I was like, bro, this is, oh fuck, I do all these things. <laughs> oh, there's the argument I made yesterday. Oh, that was the last paper I wrote in that feminism class. And it, it's, it's one of those things where I link it to people sometimes when they're into it, but a lot of the time it, people are just like, well, these are... But they're, it, it just indexes derailing topics as they apply to issues uh, of social justice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the standard, well, other people are oppressed elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Well, sure, but that doesn't mean that people aren't oppressed here. Mm-hmm. You know, there are lots of different and varying oppressions and experiences. Welcome to the world of intersectionality. Mm-hmm. Intersectionality right. podcast is a whole other podcast, <laughs> FYI. Okay, We're bracketing a ton of stuff in here. I want to do the intersectionality podcast. Maybe we can do that when we're in Scotland. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. I'm down. Sweet. Reread some Anne Gary. and. But, oh. uh, so, the thing that seems... To the like, sort of core to social justice warriors, um, it's not a movement. Like I said, it, we, we said earlier, it's a pejorative label that gets applied. Hmm. Uh, is it's internet focused? Almost nowhere in real life will you see like someone use that term, even when talking with activists or uh, like people who are working for social justice offline. Yeah, it's like you say to someone in real life and just look at you like, where did you come from? What are you on about? Mm-hmm. Like, we're, you know, we're doing a thing here, so... It, it, it does, I think in real life, like, the recent one I can think of was I was at that protest in Edinburgh and there was someone in the street who was like, oh, you're just a bunch of SJWs. And we were like, we have a megaphone. We can stand here <laughs> and tell you while you're wrong, but we're currently marching and getting it, making attention for this specific topic which is really important. And we have a news camera, so we're going to focus on that because you're a bit of an asshat. And it was really funny because this guy was determined. It was a bunch of women, and like it was a couple of guys there, but this bunch of women who were protesting about rape culture. He was determined that we were going to get his attention because he kept shouting stuff at us. And the more we annoyed him, the more annoyed he got. Like he was just like, "You're not listening to me." We're like, "Yeah, great, bye." Thing. That is true. We are not listening. Yeah, no. When, when people would call you, and like I, I sometimes use it like to describe myself. When I'm talking to people, and they'll look at me like, "What, what are you on about?" I'm like, I, it's, I think because I spend I, like we were saying, I do, I do spend a lot of time online, and I have friends who don't, and they'll look at me like, "You're a very strange person. Where did you come from?" Yeah, like it's it's particular to certain internet scenes. Mm-hmm. Like it comes up a lot in comment sections. It comes up a lot in social or in, in social media areas. And that's it. Mm-hmm. It is it is entirely an internet-based pejorative. Mm-hmm. You know, usually delivered by eggs on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Or, say, um... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like, well, I think Twitter like, is a, a big thing in it because it's really quick. You can just say, you can just fire out things on Twitter. It's really, really quick to send messages to people. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and again, you can hide behind an egg. So you can be a shithead and no one can see who you actually are. Side bracket, I'm starting to see why uh, podcasts and shows and stuff are really helpful when you're individually sitting at your own computers and you can see the other person trying to speak. It's it, it's so much easier when you can see the other person. <laughs> and I look across and I look across at the computer and wave. <laughs> you can't see me waving, but I'm waving at your at your video. Uh, next time we'll run it off the laptop and we'll put it right in front of us. Maybe, yeah. We always learn and adapt. Uh, my contribution to that is, and, and I also see it, uh, I don't spend a lot of time on Tumblr, but a lot of stuff from Tumblr gets ported onto other platforms. And yep. So you see that as well. Uh, so yeah, it's Twitter uh, and Tumblr and probably other platforms that I just I personally don't use. Um, which, which is funny because in the sh- pre-show when we were talking about it, it became very clear that um, I stand apart from Jim and, and Ted because I'm not a Luddite, but I'm definitely not an internet person, so to speak. I don't spend a lot of time on online spaces. Um, and so when you commented that even um, 
like if you were to call an activist an SJW, even they would balk at it. Like I'm not, I'm like I'm ex activist, but like I'm or you're a protester, but unless mm-hmm. you're an online. SJW, it's very rare to see that <laughs> offline, unless unless it's used in a pejorative sense, or unless somebody is is proclaiming it as as a self identifying title. Yeah, I mean, like like I said in a pre-show, my excuse for being online is, apart from a small group, most of my friends are at least three hundred miles away, mm. <laughs> so I'm online all the time to catch up with people. Yeah, no, I I spend all my time online basically. Mm. I managing internet communities is part of my job. Mm. But they, like the interesting thing I, I think about social justice warrior is how apt it is. Um, the warrior bit, which is you know they they we are internet warriors. They will fight with people on the internet. That is, like, even if you don't, you you often see people involved in other forms of activism um, or social justice endeavors. So. Uh, Zoe Quinn, for instance, is involved, and in, she she founded Crash Override, which is a, an anti harassment network. Um, and there's all kinds of individual initiatives or, or collective initiatives that people are running, but it's usually in a reaction to the mammoth amount of harassment that goes on on the internet. But it is people who will fight with you uh, if you are being racist or oppressive or um, you know, misogynist in online spaces. They're the P- and and they're described this way, I imagine, by their opponents as as the people who will come out of the woodwork specifically to fight with that. Mm-hmm. I find as well, though, it does work the opposite way around. Like you can post something that maybe has a sort of social justice lent to it. Like you're you're mm-hmm. retweeting an article that has a you know, about a specific topic or whatever, a specific issue, and people who actively against that voice come out and like, start yelling at you be like yep. why the hell are you posting this thing I'm like because it's my twitter space and I can post what I want get out mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. you know I think like, I, I, my experience has been a lot more like I don't pick fights with people I don't have the energy to pick fights with people but people like picking fights with me it turns out I just have the face for it apparently <laughs> I do pick fights with people but I, I have a, a lot of energy for that mm-hmm. And more time than I probably should. But one of the things that always comes up, and you brought this up in the in the pre-show, Huck, is that these discussions are almost universally unproductive with respect to changing people's minds. Yeah. Um, and again, we discovered, or through discovery, I suppose, um, this seems bound up or is part and parcel of my general attitude of prioritizing um, offline um, space, yeah, offline sure. space, offline activity. Um, that, and so I'll give that as an example. Um, last last year, a little over a year ago, <clears throat> I, I I got involved in a basically twenty four to thirty hour long um, f- Facebook comment argument um, with a guy who had some very particular attitudes towards how to deal with terrorists. Um, that was in air quotes, by the way. Sorry, yeah, yeah, for for our listeners, terrorists it, within quotes. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess it, with Theo on the line, it makes it makes it abundantly clear that I cannot prioritize my physical actions <laughs> as 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 conveying meaning. Um, so he had very particular attitudes towards quote terrorists that, uh, close quote, that I would probably characterize more as racism towards um, cultures stemming from the Middle East, we'll just say charitably. And um, in the end, I I shut down the conversation by, I suppose, superficially insulting his intelligence, but I basically said, okay, well, if you could point to a place on a map where we're supposed to drop these bombs, let me know, but I'm, I'm willing to bet you couldn't even do that. And he got really incensed by that, and that basically ended the conversation. And rather than gloat or, you know, egg him on further, I, I decided to just halt, like hold off on it. And at the end of it all, I just felt like that 24 hours that I let myself get sucked into replying or just, you know, saying, I'm sorry, I'm checking out of this discussion kind of deal. Um, I felt that it was a useless, unproductive use of my time because mm-hmm. I knew that no matter what kind of reasoning or 
evidence that I threw his way, and I did link towards evidence, and I did try to to use data that I could source if he were to challenge me on that level. Um, I spent a lot of time invested in this, and it, what, there was nothing I was going to be able to say online that was going to change his mind or change his attitudes. Um, and sometimes when I'm sitting as a spectator in an online space, um, you know, whether it's uh, people who capture uh, segments of chat uh, chat boxes, comment sections, uh, Tumblr blogs, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it sometimes feels echo chambery. You know, like uh, it resonates really well with the people that already buy into that attitude, and it does. It will not convince anybody outside of that attitude. Um, and so sometimes it feels like by me participating in it, and then by extension, other people investing time and energy and emotion and and, and whatnot into it. Um, you're doing it, and it's not gonna. It's, it's not going to accomplish anything, you know. It's not going to, um, it's not going to change racist attitudes. It's not going to change sexist attitudes. Women are still going to be not safe in certain spaces. Mm-hmm. Uh, minorities, racial minorities, are not going to be uh, safe in certain spaces. And so that's that's where I come from because I tend to prioritize that offline I- experience rather than online experience. And now I turn it over to my esteemed co- uh, my esteemed, <laughs> esteemed co-hosts who are going to tell me not necessarily why I'm wrong, but why I'm missing a certain key point to this. Take well, it away. I would say in, in that case, yeah, okay, you maybe not change that guy's mind, but you mm-hmm. then, by saying you won't stand for that, have planted a flag saying, my space on the internet is my space where these are my attitudes towards the world, and mm-hmm. I don't agree with your racist attitudes. Mm-hmm. So please don't keep them in my space. I mean, it, it might feel unproductive because you never got to a conclusion of that conversation because the guy went off on a huff. Mm-hmm. But then people can look back and say, oh, look, you know, Huck said this, and you know, he's mm-hmm. really not, he does not abide by racist attitudes. There's mm-hmm. probably not a sure point in trying to have this conversation with him. Mm-hmm. So in a way, you sort of you've you've made your little your little space in it. Say, look, this is attitudes that will not stand here. Mm-hmm. Well, so to be fair, it wasn't feel- my space though. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a friend's uh, it yeah. was underneath a, a post that a friend had made on, made on their page. <laughs> well, even better then you're sort of standing by you know, you're sort of saying you're like saying you know you, you're still saying like this is actually what I won't stand for. So that right. person is not going to come into your space on the internet and make that mm-hmm. conversation because it's like well there's mm-hmm. no point. Hot won't agree with me. Mm-hmm. We're just going to have this argument. Mm-hmm. So it might feel unproductive, but in a way mm-hmm. you've kind of said you're you're, you're showing your attitudes to the world and that you kind of made this little space. It's yours to say like. No, you don't get to do that in here. Oh, I do remember one little bit of context, uh, why I did carry on for 24 hours. This is around the time that there was, um, so you might not have heard about it on your side of the pond, Ted, but you, Jim, you might remember it. Uh, mm-hmm. This was around this time last year where a Muslim mother had been punched in the face or something nope, by two, two men in Toronto once she was on her way to go pick up the students. And, and the oh, reason yeah. why... Yeah, okay, so you did hear about it. And the, so the reason why at the time I remember thinking that I wanted to carry on is, you know, online internet people are harmless, but these people have these thoughts and these thoughts tend to dictate their actions and these actions lead to punching people and assaulting people in, in, in you know, like mothers going to pick up their child, which is why I kept going on about it, which is why afterwards when the everything was said and done and I hadn't changed his mind, it almost felt like a failure. Like I just wasted yeah. my time because this person still holds on to these attitudes and is still like is still going to behave from these first principles, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So. So I mean, like I would, I would go further. Uh, in the sense that it isn't even a, it isn't even about planting a flag. Um, it is about reclaiming sp- online spaces from oppressive attitudes and oppressive speech, and like creating spaces that are hostile to that, like flat out hostile. In the same way that your body is hostile to flus. Hmm. They're creating antibodies. Yeah, like let us just, let us take for granted that racism should be unwelcome everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like that is our starting point. Mm-hmm. At which point, when we encounter it, we have an obligation to, at the very least, confront it. Um bracketing a whole conversation about the fact that that takes a lot of energy and you and you do have to take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. 
But on the whole, the notion is is reclaiming spaces. It is that it is showing people that this place does not belong to you. This place is for everyone. And part of what that means is that it needs to be safe for everyone. And the fact that it is apparently not safe uh, on Twitter to be a racist because you might get fired or whatever seems fine. Yeah, see, that, that's why I, I started the blogs I did recently because I'm like, this is my space to see the things I want to say about the world. And if people come in and try and be hostile about that, I have the right to shut them down because that's my space. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, you can't just come in here and yell horrendous things at me because you think it's okay. Because in the real world, it's not. Like, it, I don't even know. It's like, there's certain spaces, there are certain spaces on the internet that are toxic and are going to be toxic and you're not going to change that. Mm-hmm. And it's trying to keep the people who have that mindset in those spaces and not ruining the rest of the spaces. It's a tricky mm. bit. Yeah. One of the things I find, um, and I thought about this after our pre-show discussion, but before <laughs> we started filming, is in in offline space, um, it is very easy to exclude people from from certain spaces just based on um, power imbalances. Mm-hmm. So when you have power, it's very easy it's very easy and low cost even to to kind of gate off spaces uh, without really much effort. You know, like if a person's not welcome, they kind of they leave on their own accord uh, some yeah, of the time. Like chilling effect. Yeah. Whereas whereas online spaces, um, short of hacking, it's very easy to to gate off a safer space. Like. Um, you know, people have to be members, and then the members can be um, uh, banned. Um, it's like there, there, are, there, are, you know, there are ways to get through those kinds of safeguards, but for the most part, it's easier to gate off the space. space. My worry is that, again, like the offline space, it's very hard to do that unless, like, you already have that space kind of reclaimed as this is this is a, a space where we don't tolerate that. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to to bring that into the offline space. Yeah. I mean, you can see that happening even now. With uh, There was a club vote in Britain recently that excluded women. Oh, Scotland, why do you do these things? Muirfield Golf Club. That's uh, the one. Gullin, just outside Edinburgh. It's one of the old golf courses. It's on, it's been on the open, um, like the open tournament, like Rota for a long, long, long time. And they had a vote recently because there's a story, I read the story, um, this woman... She's a, a, quite a keen golfer, and her husband's quite a keen golfer. And for her, I can't remember if it was her 60th birthday or somewhere around there, he said, I'll take you to Muirfield and we'll have a game on the Muirfield course. And then when they went to the clubhouse afterwards, she had to sit outside while he went in to get them a drink because she wasn't allowed in. As she was sitting there waiting for her husband to come back, a man with his dog walked in. And the dog was allowed in, but she wasn't. And they had a vote recently to... Have women because the, the the Royal and Ancient, which is the golf course in St Andrews, that's the the famous golf course. Mm-hmm. They had this vote about oh, 10, 15 years ago, and they agreed to have a and the women said we'll have a separate clubhouse. We just want to have a club, and it's it's thriving. Like there's so many members to it, and the women at Muirfield said we'll do the same thing. We'll wear your uniform. We'll have a separate room in the clubhouse. We just want to be allowed to be members and have a space, and the members there all voted no. Of course. So they basically got told. That's cool. You can be a really sexist old club. You're no longer on the rotor for the open. And I think they estimated it was something like two hundred million pounds that's taken out the local economy for not being on that rotor that rotor for the open tournament anymore. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, the British pound is valid currency inside the golf club? Yes. So women are allowed inside the golf club as long as they're on bills. Yeah, pretty much. The Queen's allowed inside the banknote. Classy. Yeah, it, the problem they, they reckon the problem with that is most of the members of the golf club are in their sort of sixties, seventies, and there's a definitely a trend in I don't know about where you are, but definitely here, definitely a trend of every sort of over fifty. There's there's very much institutional sort of sexism, racism stuff goes yeah. on with the, with the generation, and uh, they think that's a large part in it. But they've now yeah, like it's in the local economy, like Gullen and the town that's nearby. They reckon there's something like two hundred million pounds going to be lost to that local economy because the whole circus of the, the open tournament and the cameras, I think, mean, is not going to go there anymore. Yeah. They've also so we're getting a little off topic. 
Yeah, they always but... turn around and told Trump that he's not allowed just to barge his way onto the calendar either. <laughs> his golf course. As but uh, no, there's a big focus on reclaiming spaces. It's been, and you, you mentioned private spaces and creating mm-hmm. private spaces. And that's an argument that comes up a lot mm-hmm. online is, is, well, go and create a forum. Mm-hmm. Go and create a blog. Go and create your own private site and talk about whatever you want there. Mm-hmm. Uh, happens all the time on Reddit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, go create your own subreddit where you can do your own thing. We're going to do our own thing here. But there are lots of public spaces online. Mm-hmm. Twitter is a huge example of that. You can follow anybody you want on Twitter as long as their account isn't locked. Mm-hmm. And it's those spaces where you'll you'll often see people fighting hard to reclaim them to get to get a foothold mm-hmm. because they are public, mm-hmm. and it matters that people don't just exist in private spaces; they exist in public spaces. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the same way that um, things like Take Back the Night rallies are about women reclaiming public spaces and mm. reclaiming the, their right to be safe mm-hmm. in public spaces. That ends the six-foot-tall white guy's comment on Take Back the Night rallies because mm-hmm. that's a topic for a whole other day. Mm-hmm. I think we're, we're sorry, we're, and to give uh, the, the listener or the, our audience a little bit of context, the reason why we started talking about this is Remember that I uh, I tend to prioritize the offline space and by pro or not proxy as an example of it you know like I I work at a bar so like it's it's a huge open space where I can to a certain degree police that space is literally your job too well I, yeah and and so like I have on occasion kicked people out for racist comments uh, and whatnot um, or people who are uh, like uh, where people complain about the behavior of other people. Um, it, it, it is something that I do. It's something I'm paid to do. Um, and so my kind of old man huck mentality of it, it doesn't do anything is like, it silences, you know, the, 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 the dick. dick. It, it silences, silences an ass hat, hat. Uh, on an online space. And they just go away to another space mm-hmm. to say their stuff. And much in the same way, like, I would rather change their mind, even though, as Jim says, that's not really necessarily the point of having these discussions to change it. Um, but that person is going to log off their computer and then continue to be an ass in real mm-hmm. spaces and affect other people. Um, and and here's here's the division of where I prioritize the offline space. Like for example, I want to um, I want to train to become a paramedic because I feel that I want to help people, um, you know, medically in, in the in the for for medical emergency medical emergencies and whatnot. So. Um, that is kind of where I tend my focus, and it's not that I don't think the online spaces are imp- uh, are not important of, uh, in that regard. It's just I tend to prioritize it one way. But just because I prioritize it the one way doesn't mean that that's the only way to go or that the other way is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think sometimes I forget about that, and other people who fall in a similar line to me tend to, to go that way of, uh, because I don't find value in it, it, it therefore doesn't have value. As opposed to no, it doesn't. You don't have value in it. That doesn't mean it's not incredibly important to somebody else or incredibly useful to somebody else. I would ask you then, right, if say when you're working at the bar and you mm-hmm. you turn someone away because they're being abusive to someone else in the line or whatever, where do they then? They, where do they go at that point? And probably just to another bar. Right. So are you saying like you're saying it's like when you silence someone on Twitter, they just go away somewhere else and harass someone else. Mm-hmm. But I would say like what like what I do on Twitter when I like. If I confront people, or you know, like I, I have these like fights with people, I can ban those people from my space. So you can't come into my space. But mm-hmm. then people who are following me will see that this person has done this thing and can block them as well. So in a way, it's it's almost like I'm acting as a bouncer for those people because I'm stopping this person or them coming into contact with this harmful stuff that this person's saying. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, I don't always feel safe doing that. I don't always feel I'm able to do that. And other people do it for me mm-hmm. when I'm in that situation. But I know people who sometimes don't feel safe confronting these people, and I can because I can say to them, "Look, you know what you're doing. You're you're harassing someone. You're being really abusive. You need to leave." Mm-hmm. And if that person gets worse, and we all know, just you know, block them, silence them, do not give them a platform, move them away. Mm-hmm. And it, I, it feels like a bit like the same sort of idea as what you're saying. Like you can physically move someone on. This is like on the online space. We're kind of moving someone on. It may be, like you said, you're not necessarily going to change their mind space. You know, they're 
might go and be abusive somewhere else. But the fact that they've been abusive and they've had this fight online has kind of red flagged this person to other people who see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're hitting on the point too that that behavior hasn't gone unchallenged. Like the the issue in a lot of spaces. I mean, you find this all the all the time in old boys clubs, for example. Is people are allowed to behave however they want. You can be a misogynist, and no one else will challenge it. Yeah. And that behavior should be challenged. That is not it is not okay. And challenging it is what one of the things that helps create more space and make spaces safer mm -hmm. is the fact that, no, there are people here who will not tolerate. And the other thing I think that the social justice warrior sort of pejorative misses out on is the fact that the internet is a real place. It is as real as a bar. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is... It is if, if you want to argue between physical and digital, sure, but all digital is physical. You are not physically present and walking around, but you are engaging with people in the same kinds of ways. You can flirt, you can fight, you can fall in love, you can do all kinds of stuff on the internet. And pretty soon it's going to be cheaper to, to do that visually with Oculus Rift and any other virtual reality technologies. Sure. Where you are now able to, in some sense, navigate a space by proxy physically. Yeah. I mean, like, think about um, the internet. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys. I wouldn't know you guys. Yeah. Mm. Um, Theo and I met on Twitter, I want to say, like, four years ago. Uh, well, Facebook doing a popped up. Challenge. Yeah, Facebook popped up in January and said we've been Facebook friends for four years. So it was maybe slightly more than that. Yeah, about that. And, yeah, a little more. But, you know, th these are these spaces are, are real. The connections that, that are created there are genuine. We talked about that in our social media episode. Mm -hmm. And... The notion that the, the actions on the internet don't count is a notion that entirely aids harassers. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a notion that actual law enforcement is now con is now contending with: is that what do you do when you have people who are being harassed internationally? How do you deal with that? Or, or worse, with things like swatting. Mm -hmm. Um, but swatting, at least, there's an identifiable crime that happens. Mm -hmm. And for those who are not aware of what swatting is, r really quickly, uh, it's link in the show notes too. Yeah, uh, it's usually where um, somebody online calls in a fake threat of some kind that would mobilize basically a, um, a SWAT team or some sort of specialized police force to break down or break into a place. And it's often done to gamers or streamer like any yep, kind streamers. of streamers any kind of uh usually happens to streamers where they're streaming say on twitch or something like that and somebody will will call police on them and and threat or say that they're threatening with some sort of uh clear and present danger weapons bomb or whatever mm -hmm. and then a swat team will will show up and uh and to investigate which is horrible to think that it, that would happen it's to absolutely you. terrifying yeah the whole the whole thought of it is completely terrifying uh, or doxing is the other uh, yeah. uh, example. Yeah. Which is just exposing people's personal information online uh, and allowing all kinds of people access to it. Like I, Again, I, I will take it as given that online harassment is a real thing. I mean, there are tons of documented examples. You can go on. There's a laundry list. If I may f score a point from my side, though. Doxing, side? doxing and swatting are dangerous because they affect you in the offline space more yes. than anything else. <laughs> yes. Like, it, it is dangerous to dox because uh, then I, somebody can physically find you. It is dangerous to swat because somebody is affecting you in the, in the offline space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is, that is, that is, sorry, what? All my details are like mm. behind as many walls as I can put them behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking no chance of that because I know mm -hmm. the sort of people who target people like me. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly want. I mean, the, to be fair, if the police and Cooper turn up at my door, they probably my parents went blank and eye like because me and Becky used to kind of grass on people quite a lot. But <laughs> you know, like if the police turn up at my door, I'd be like, um, what? You know, it would it would be rather terrifying. I don't mm -hmm. particularly want to have to do yeah. that. No, it, but but these are consequences that happen in 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 offline space. But meat, they're meat space. Meat space. Yeah. I like the term meat space. <laughs> it isn't a term that I often use um, in mixed company, but yes. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> it's 
face filled with meat. Ew. They're, and the result? They're, they're made of meat. They think. Yeah, I know. Thinking meat. For meat bags. <laughs> and the the, the result is this, a sort of. I don't know. I don't want to say that there's a, a need for social justice warriors. I think that that um, confers too much onto what is essentially a pejorative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a need for people to confront that behavior always in all spaces. And mm -hmm. this is a form that it has taken online. Again, like, I think um, different people are going to feel different levels of ability of how much they can speak out against that, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I happen to be... In the local parlance, I'm a gobshite. Um, a what? I do just, Excuse me? A gobshite. It is someone who just talks her mouth off, and I have talked myself into trouble before. But I'm like, I am willing to stand up for people who are a bit scared to do it. Like, I used to, like, I had a thing at school, like, my friends would come to me, like, look, this idiot's chasing us going like pal about me at lunchtime so if they do come over you can tell them to fuck off because that's kind of what I did and, and I, you, have, I, you have blogs devoted to that don't you oh, oh, oh yeah oh yeah where are your but, blogs uh, like, it's, it is it's like it's not everyone's going to feel the need to stand up and it, it is the people who feel they can speak out that usually do attract these idiots who decide that SJW is a horrible way to hurt people mm -hmm. gobshite I like that that, uh, okay. <clears throat> actually, that actually falls in line with something my uh, a lesson that I kind of learned from my dad, where he would um, he he like what he would often say because he he grew up uh, lower socioeconomic status, and uh, and I guess he got picked on a lot when he was a kid, and and I and I asked him about it one time, and he kind of just shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, if they're picking on me, that means they're leaving somebody else alone. Right. Uh, yeah. I was I was I was uh, struck by that. Like, wow, that's like that's something. Like, I really looked up to my dad. For for one of the reasons, like one of the reasons, that was definitely like, wow, my dad, like, and he would pick fights with people to, to protect the little guy, kind of deal. Like when they were being picked on, he would he would step into a fight to like protect his younger brother. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a brother, but but by proxy, other people like that. So. Yeah, no, I've definitely done that. I've definitely stepped in when I've seen like a friend being harassed online, and they're not quite sure how to deal with it. I'll step in and try and take the heat off of them because I'm like, if I can deal with it, I will. There are times I can't. There are times I have really bad days, and then people have pick on me. And I'm just like, whoa, I can't deal with this today. Hmm. But if I can, I will usually step up. Hmm. So, Huck, if people want to fight with you on the internet, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, RJ Huckle. You can find me on Instagram, R Huckle. Yep, I think it is. Um, Facebook, I think I have it set up so it's harder to find me if you're. No, if Facebook's we're... private. Yeah. Um... Tumblr. <clears throat> what? Yeah, your Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do have a Tumblr, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I, because I, I posted just for the, the doodles. You're awful. I, I don't really spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> s scoping out Tumblr, and all, all the people that I follow on Tumblr are all like artists and stuff. So I have no, no you idea. You can find them on Tumblr, also in the show notes. Uh, and I do have a, I do have a little bit of a website blog started. Uh, we can link to that down below. That's uh, about my, my journey into, to medicine. Uh, so that's. I think it's ryanhuckle.wordpress.com, but we'll, we'll link it down in, down below. All right, and uh, Theo, I know you've been trying to dodge from one of your blogs, but I'm going to make you do it. Which one? Yes. Which one do you want? Oh, you're such a jerk. I have two. We'll put um, all Theo's blogs in the show notes. Yeah, I have two. I have this, this Theo's Clubhouse, which is more sort of just broad social justice topics. And then there's other one which name, I, I am so amused by this name still. I came up with the name in the shower. Um, I have one about sort of trans life and more trans issues. It's called "You Shall Not Pass." <laughs> <laughs> it's something I will never do, and I'm quite proud I will never do. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's my blogs. And as always, if you want to Twitter. fight with me, I'm. Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. My my Twitter is Captain Word Beard. Nice. Uh, Which, and as always, if you want to fight with me, go ahead. No, so I, I came up with that in an attempt to impress a girl. Hmm. Did it work? <laughs> My Twitter handle. It did, did it work? work? Yeah, it worked. Excellent. Victory. <laughs> uh, no, if you want to fight with me, I am Concept Crucible on Twitter. And you can find me at jimtickwell.com. Or in the comment section down below. Or, yeah, we have we have a, two perfectly good comment sections. Yeah. 
feel free to do whatever you want there and expect that if you do things that are inappropriate that we will confront you mm -hmm. or call you out in a video anyway I'm Jim I'm Ryan I'm Theo we're signing off stay awesome alright let's get this show on the road for real yeah go uh, here's how it's going to work. I assume that you know how it's going to work, actually, because you've heard at least one podcast. I've heard several of your podcasts. There you go. Then you know how it works. You're yeah. way better off than literally every other guest we've had. <laughs>